Hello and welcome to Ancient Gaming, where I cover all games and show you how to play them. The other day, I went with my friends to the little Spanish town of Belmonte, where every year a big medieval tournament is celebrated. Fighters all around Spain, France and Portugal gather, fully covered in armor, to recreate the long-gone tradition of the old European knights and nobles. In this video, I will briefly cover the history behind these events, and clear some misconceptions along the way. Medieval tournament is, after all, a vague denomination, and formal combats in the Middle Ages could and often were varied, both in scope and context. As reference, I will be mainly using the PhD thesis of Rachel E. Whitbread about tournaments, jousts and duels, which is an outstanding work on the subject. And also will put some of the footage I recorded in the background, so you get an idea of how these tournaments played out. So with all that, let's start with the basics. What exactly is a tournament? The word itself is of course of French origin, and stems from the old French tournament. A tournament as understood in modern historiography can essentially be any form of formalized combat, from jousts to malaise and even single duels, regardless of the number of participants, place and socio-political context of the event itself. But chroniclers in the Middle Ages would have probably found difficulties reading our modern works on the subject, since for many, a tournament was something quite more specific. In his Livre de la Chevalerie, written around 1350, Geoffroy de Charny used, for instance, the word joust to refer to a combat where one individual fights another with spears or lances on horseback and the word tournament to refer to a group combat on horseback that involved various weapons, including lances, but also swords and axes. According to Geoffroy, the footage you see on screen would not, in fact, be a tournament, and neither would for most of the later chroniclers, who also used the word to describe almost exclusively a mounted melee combat featuring groups of men fighting with a variety of weapons. But at the end of the day, chroniclers in the Middle Ages had as much trouble as we do when trying to capture the various forms of formalist combat under a single umbrella term. Our manuscripts use a wide variety of words to refer to these events, and it is only with time that some of them would come to describe a certain set of circumstances and equipment. Ironically, tournament was by no means the preferred word for writers and heralds, the typical way to refer to formal combats in general, and the one most present in our sources by far was the pas d'armes, or feat of arms. These could be fought in a variety of ways, on horseback, foot, or a combination of the two. Other popular, albeit more specialist terms used were the also French shoot or the Latin hastiludia, which literally means game of spears, but was often used as a synonym for jousts. Besides this, there were many other more occasional ways to refer to both general and particular types of formal combat, like factum armorum, festum, lancia, coup de lance, etc. All of them, however, had one thing in common, and that was the danger of combats. This was particularly true with melee combats, one of the earliest and most dangerous forms of formal combat. The distinction between these events and the extent to which they were formalized or even carried a recreational tone is blurry, at least until the 13th century, to the point that narrators often portrayed earlier melee tournaments as little removed from actual warfare, and with some extreme cases ending in an actual bloodshed. There was, however, a distinction between combats fought à plaisance and those fought à autrance. The distinction between them was based on the intent of the participants. Combats fought à plaisance used blunt or protected weapons and were stopped when a given number of hits had been delivered, or were used as a more general practices in which the intention was to overcome one's opponent without killing or wounding him. Combats fought à autrance, on the other hand, were fought to the extreme normally with sharp weapons and with the intention of doing physical harm to the opponent. Some combats out once were even fought until one of the combatants was killed or wounded so that he could not continue to fight, or until a judge intervened and stopped the combat. Aside from early melees, of all forms of formal combat, jousts were by far the most dangerous. Charges were swift and brutal, and there was no space for any jets to stop an unfortunate lunch. Jean de Vuel, a renowned veteran of the Hundred Years' War, speaks in his Le Juvencel about one of such events. He says, The most perilous feats of arms in the world are those on horseback and of the lance. You can have the right arm very lightly armored and more, if you can, except right at the armpit, where you must have a strong and well-attached defense, for all wayward lances are driven there, and it has caused the loss of many men. 
Jean de Vuel indeed knew this better than anyone, for he was here, in fact, narrating the death of his own brother, falling right before his eyes. And indeed, narrating was a big part of these events, since that is why we do know about them in the first place. And for that, we have to thank the Heralds. Since stakes were high, formal combats, especially in the late Middle Ages, were often arranged under a quite specific set of rules or conditions, and in some cases had dedicated manuscripts organized in a sort of clauses or chapitres, with all sort of details regarding the manner of combat, weapons to be used, and other regulations such as the number of courses to be run on horseback or the price for the victors. All this was meticulously compiled by heralds, officers of arms who conveyed the message in the name of the knight or knights who posed the challenge. The proclamation for defeat of arms was typically forwarded by a praise to God and the Virgin Mary, as well as to the lords of the knight and of the region, followed by an introduction of the nobility and status of the combatants. The chapitres could vary in length and number, and are arguably the most interesting part of these manuscripts, since they are the reason we know how the event was played out. Here's an example of a couple of such chapitres from a feat of arms within a codex of the Leeds Royal Armourist Library, so you know what they usually look like. The first chapitre is that whoever shall touch my emprise is obliged to fulfil and accomplish these feats of arms, both on horseback and on foot, and none may touch the emprise unless he be a gentleman without reproach. The second chapitre is that whosoever shall touch my emprise shall be obliged to fulfil and accomplish these feats of arms on horseback at the tilt until one of us shall have broken four lances, that is to say, from a foot and a half before the rest to the two or three inches behind the lance head. As you see, almost nothing was left out of the picture, but if anything was expected is that the combatants, whomever they may be, would constitute a model of pride, virtue and Honor. Honor and the maintenance of one's reputation were often portrayed as the most important benefits obtained through formal martial combat. This personal fame was often described as renommé or renown and became central to an individual's status during life and even after his death. Honor or renown was to a knight a sort of resume of his greatest deeds and achievements. It helped him thrive within the ever competitive landscape of courtly life and aristocracy to the point that it could often become a key element in a judicial process. The combatants had indeed to be gentlemen without reproach, and knights of unblemished reputation. Lack of hereditary qualification or marriage below one state were, for instance, the most useful reproaches against would-be jousters. But there were far other requirements that sought to filter for the most outstanding chivalric behaviors, and some of them are quite funny. Here's a list from a 15th century manuscript of Antoine de la Salle, relating to chivalric combat. There shall not be admitted any, however noble they may be, who are smirched with any of the following reproaches. That they are violators of churches, hardened excommunicates, slanderers of womankind or men who have done ladies dishonor, murderers of malice prepense, men false to their oaths or sealed pledges, Fugitives, guilty of cowardice in the field. Men who have been discomfited in the duel on an issue of honor. Arsonists, leaders of free companies, and pirates of the sea. Formal combats were, in essence, the quintessential demonstration of the values of chivalry, only surpassed in honor by actual open warfare, and they were accompanied by the literary paraphernalia and pageantry that adorned the minds and cultivated the imagination of the humblest of folks and the vainest of nobles. Knights fought for the glory of their souls, the pride of their lords, and the love of their ladies. And the ladies had indeed their place here as well in their own unique way. Combats, and particularly jousts, were often fought not only for honor, but also for love, for the love of the lady, that is, a recurring motif for all the challenges of this kind, and that most likely had its roots in the heroic romance literature of the High Middle Ages, where writers displayed fantastic stories about marble-filled adventures and the ideals of courtly love, some of which still echo today in the names of legendary figures such as Lancelot du Lac or Amadis de Gaula. This, however, was by any means a formality, and was taken in high regard. Knights competed in order to gain honor and renown in the name of the ladies, who often participated in the ceremony surrounding the event, as prize-givers and even judges. 
a formal announcement from the joust celebrated in 1390 at Smithfield by Richard II, describes how 20 knights would be led through London by 20 ladies, each knight carrying a shield with Richard's white heart badge on it, and each lady wearing a green dress to match the colors worn by the knights. After the combats, the announcement promised that the ladies who had observed the jousting would award various prizes to the combatants, including a greyhound, a golden horn, and a white griddle. In the words of Whitbread, women became, in this way, providers of inspiration through their portrayal as encouraging a combination of erotic love and martial ambition in their associated men. Time moves mountains, but after all, some things will always be the same. And speaking of time, how do medieval tournaments look like today? Most tournaments today consist largely on melee combats, but you can also find occasional jousting tournaments like those of Kenilworth and Hevercastle in England or the Giostra del Sarazzino in the Italian town of Arezzo. Combatants, of course, are no longer required to be knights of noble birth or even gentlemen, but all of them do their best efforts to recreate the historical armor, weapons, and even martial arts of the Middle Ages. These are known as HEMA, which stands from Historical European Martial Arts, and most of the fighters practice them on a regular basis. They learned them through surviving medieval manuscripts, mainly dating between the 1300s and the 1800s, like the Fiori dei Liberi and the Codex Falastein, and sometimes combined them with modern forms of formal martial arts. As for the event itself, it is scheduled pretty much like a festival, with a fenced open area for the combats, food stands and trinket stalls, which, on the other hand, it is not so different as to how tournaments were celebrated back in the day. The enrollment for the combats and the combats themselves are programmed more in line with current federated sport practices, like double elimination brackets or Swiss-style tournaments, alongside with other minor elements and common practices of modern martial arts. Aside from that, the combat rules try to resemble as closely as possible those from the manuscripts and sources they are based upon, but with a wider set of additions and refinements to adapt them to modern sports standards, safety protocols, and competitive fair play. But don't let me spoil the fun. If you really want to experience these events in all their glory, there's nothing like seeing them by yourselves. So dust off your armor, sharpen your weapons, and jump aboard this historical roller coaster. Thanks a lot for watching the video, and as always, leave a like if you learned something new, and subscribe for more content about ancient games and history. I will see you guys in the next one.